move up to the tables in the front. We're going to leave uh, the back tables open for the people that come in later on tonight. First, like to thank everybody for coming out and remind everybody that this is our Islamic Awareness Week. We have a lot of events going on. And I want to thank everybody that's been taking a good part in organizing the day and night events. Uh, please remember, if you don't have a card, to please pick one up over there and uh, get it whole punch that every day and night event that you have for a chance to win an iPad 2 at the end of the week. Um, there's been a lot of preparation going on into this event, so if you see, if you see anybody uh, that is preparing, be sure to thank them for the work that they've put in. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to start the event with the way we start all our events, and that will be with a Quran recitation by Brother Ahmed Sultan, followed by a translation by Amasha. Moses and Jesus, 
namely that you should remain steadfast in religion and make no divisions therein to those who worship other things than Allah. Hard is the way to which you call. Allah chooses to himself those whom he pleases and guides to himself those who turn to him. And they became divided only after knowledge reached them through selfish envy as between themselves. Had it not been for a word that went forth before from your Lord, tending to a term appointed, the matter would have been settled between them. But truly those who have inherited the book after them are in suspicious disquieting doubt concerning it. Now then, for that reason, call them to faith, as stand steadfast as you are commanded, nor you follow their vain desires, but say, I believe in the book which Allah has sent down, and I am commanded to judge justly between you. Allah is our Lord and your Lord. For us is a responsibility for our deeds, and for you, for your deeds. There is no contention between us and you. Allah will bring us together, and to Him is our final goal. But those who dispute concerning Allah, after He has been accepted, futile in their dispute in the sight of their Lord, on them is wrath, and for them will be a terrible penalty. It is Allah who has sent down the book in truth and the balance by which to weigh conduct, and what will make you realize that perhaps the hour is close at hand. So the Allah Thank you. Thank you, uh, brothers Ahmed and Ahmad, for uh, those ayahs and those tra that translation. And thank you to the audience for being mindful and respectful to the ayahs that were recited. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce my co-host tonight, Brother Omar Maki, who will give us a little brief on the program and the keynote speaker. And I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have some events going on. We will have a game going on later tonight, a uh, family feud type game. So I encourage all of you guys to sign up, brothers and sisters alike. For more information over at the table, please sign up. Uh, and without further ado, once again, Brother Omar Maki. How's everybody doing? You guys enjoy the barbecue? Yeah! Yeah! Alright, Kareem enjoy the barbecue. Uh, I'd just like to give a brief uh, introduction to our speaker, Dr. Yahya Hindi. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Hin Dr. Uh, Hindi was actually the first uh, Muslim chaplain, full-time university chaplain in America. He served at Georgetown University. Uh, he received his undergraduate education in Islamic studies and did a uh, master's and PhD in comparative religion. Uh, he also plays a political role, having met with uh, Presidents Clinton, Bush, as well as most recently President Obama. Uh, he's always on the move. He's been to over 63 countries and 45 U.S. states, uh, giving lectures and attending various Islamic conferences. Um, he's also made various TV and radio, international uh, and national TV and radio appearances. Uh, such as ABC, Fox, CNN, and uh, Al Jazeera. And if you guys want to learn more about Dr. Hindi, you can visit his website, uh, imamyahyahindi.com. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to leave the stage to Dr. Hindi. In the name of the Almighty God, the Creator, the Fashioner, the Pre-Eternal and the Post-Eternal, the one whose essence is mercy, whose essence is love and affection, whose essence is goodness, 
whose essence is perfect, who has always been and will continue to be in existence. I praise God as there is no one worthy of worship except God, and I praise God for what God has always been and will continue to be, a source of inspiration, a source of goodness and perfection, mercy, and compassion. My dear brothers and honored sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and the blessings of the Almighty One be with you. It is indeed my honor to, to be with you this evening and to try to engage you on a very important topic such as the one that we are about to dive into. Uh, women and men of God. Uh, when I was in dialogue with uh, let me say about um, what should I speak about, and I was told that the title was supposed to be Men of God. I said, we need to add women. So I hope sisters are happy now. I say this because I do believe that in the Muslim community, as well as in every religion I know, people have only focused on one side of their tradition and overlooked the other side of their own tradition, including Muslims, and we have to be honest about it. Nothing to hide, it's reality, uh, and I don't believe it has been the case with, with Islam, with Muslims. I believe women were in the forefront, in the making of the community, uh, since the time of Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace. Unfortunately, in the last 100 and so years, Muslims have failed to honor the tradition, the rich tradition of Islam, where women were partners with men in the making and the creating, the creation of the community that it, that it, has, it, has, it has become. You, I always talk about how uh, people talk about Adam, but they forget about Eve. They talk about Ibrahim, Abraham, but they forget about Sarah or Hagar. They talk about uh, Moses and they forget about his mother and sister. They talk about the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace and forget about Khadija and Aisha and Umm Salama and so many other names of women. In the science of Hadith, we talk about uh, 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 the men who have narrated Hadith. But we overlook the literally tens of thousands of women who were also narrators of Hadith. And the whole discipline for the study of Islam is not only for the study of men, males, but rather for the study of all those who have contributed to that discipline in our wonderful uh, uh, tradition. Unfortunately, we, we forgot about it. One of the best books uh, that discussed this was uh, written back in, uh, I believe, 1987 by the current Muhammad al-Ghazali, in current meaning vis-a-vis -vis Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Muhammad al-Ghazali died about 12 years ago. He has a book called uh, uh, that talk about women. And within it, there's a chapter that is called Safahatun min al tarikh Matwiyah in Arabic. Forgotten pages of history. Pages of history that we have to be proud of as Muslims. But we forget about them, we don't address, address them. So this is why I thought women and men of, of, of God and Islam and the Quran does not only talk about men, it talks also about women. The Quran talks about Maryam, the mother of Jesus, has a chapter dedicated to her, named after her. The Quran talks about women who have failed to honor the commandments, and talks about women who have honored the commandments. The Quran talks about men who have failed, and men who have done well. So the Quran deals with both men and women on equal basis, uh, in every way, shape, and form, I believe from at least my way of understanding the, the, the Quran and understanding Islam. Uh, take for example Surah 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, or other surahs that talk about how God created the, the human race from nafs in wahida. I believe the best translation of the word nafs is not soul, but rather essence. That God created Adam and Eve from the same essence. And for me the proof of that is the hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace, said that God took handful of dust 
from different places on earth, imagine, put all of them together, so you have a pile of dust. And God said, be, kun, and it became Adam and Eve at the same time. This is why I am with that understanding that Adam and Eve come from the same soul, from the same essence. And believe me, and I believe that is a clear distinction between the biblical and Quranic narration or narrative of the creation. Where in the Bible it talks about how Eve came out from the rib of Adam. The Quran talks about how they both came from the same essence, from that dust. And therefore I always say how the Islamic story of, of, of creation from its beginning uh, asserts equality between men and women. Equality in creation from day one. But also after that, equality before the law, uh, at least divine law. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2, God speaks to both of them. Do not eat both of you from that tree. And the Quran says both of them failed to eat to honor the law. So it's not as we have learned from biblical history that it was Eve who convinced Adam to eat from the tree. So it was women upon them be cursed till the end of time according to some, to, to some historical narrations. Islam would not ascribe to that theology from the very beginning. Not only that they came from the same essence, dust, they are also equal before God, and they both fail or do good. And therefore, one must not blame women for what men do. If you go to the Encyclopedia of Religion, you will see exactly that. Under, under if you have a, a, an iPad as I do, go and uh, Google sin under the Encyclopedia of Religion. Or when you go back to the library, do that. Sin, and look underneath or under the concept of original sin, you'll be surprised. Where Eve is told, cursed will you be till the end, till the end of time. It's because of you have Adam sin. And it's because of you has a humanity sin. And it's because of you has God become man who had to die on the cross for the redemption of humanity from its original sin. Quite amazing. Islam does not in any way, shape, and form ascribe to that theology. It's not our Muslim theology. And I don't say this in a negative or a positive way. I'm not trying to downplay the role of any religion. This is history. This is theological fact that, that shaped how uh, uh, ethics played a role in, in the histories of, of these uh, two communities. So let's keep that in mind, my brothers and my sisters. By the way, I have not started my lecture yet. It's only an appetizer. You know appetizer, you know? So if you go to a restaurant and they, you ask for calamari first, fried wine and soup. I have not done the soup yet. So sit back and see if I can challenge you with some of the perceptions that you may have had in, 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 in your mind for, about Islam. Uh, so let's start there. Women and men of God, and not only men, of God. Islam is quite very, very clear in, 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 that, in that regard. Uh, I was told that our audience here would be Christian, Muslim, and Jewish. And uh, I thought it's uh, worth uh, reminding all of you that uh, uh, Shalom in Hebrew, Shalom Aleinu or Alechem or Alaikum in Arabic is the greeting uh, and the best greeting in humanity has ever known, therefore I greet you with the greeting of, of, of peace. May the peace of God be with each and every one of you, my brothers and my sisters. Uh, this is the greeting of all the prophets of God, from Adam to our very time, from Eve and Adam to Muhammad, through Abraham, or Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and, and, and Miriam. I know for Muslims amongst you, you are used to, we are used to always sing Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May the peace of God be upon him every time we say the word Muhammad. Please allow me not to do that every time I say Muhammad, at least today. It becomes sometimes redundant and I do not want to do that for the sake of keep going on with my lecture. So if I don't do that, don't think I'm, I'm not respectful of the Prophet or any of the Prophets of, of, of God. 
So we are about, and I thought the best thing I wanted to do tonight, if we have enough time, is to talk about all the prophets and the messengers of God, or some of them at least, and focus after that on the prophet Muhammad himself. I wanted to draw a clear analogy as to the similarities and the common grounds the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, upon him be peace, and the other prophets have, have, have in mind. So let us discuss what those messengers had in common, teachings, struggles, experiences, and, 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 and impact. Recently, I produced a DVD you can uh, buy from Amazon. Uh, I'm not into marketing now, maybe we can do that later. It's called uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam more in common than you think. And my main thesis in, on, on, in, in the DVD is to show, especially Christians and Muslims, and Jews, sorry, that Islam is not this strange religion that worships an idol god or a moon god, as some people may think in Florida or in Tennessee. And hopefully my presentation will show that today. Uh, uh, so th the legacy of Prophet Muhammad starts from the time of Ibrahim, Avram in Hebrew, or Abraham in, in, in English. Abraham had two wives, Sarah or Sarah and Hajar or Hagar in English. Now, the Quranic narration says that Abraham married both. Islam does not subscribe to the theology or to the belief that uh, Sarah was the legitimate wife and he only had an intimate relationship with Hajar with the hope of uh, producing or giving birth or being pregnant of Ismail. Both were actually wives. The Quran does not use the word maiden that you would come across in Genesis or in the Bible. The Quran and Islam would use the word wife and hadith. So that, let's keep that in mind. Sarah, as you know, for the Muslim here, gave birth to Isaac. Hajar gave birth to Ismail. Isaac is the forefather of both Jesus through his mother Maryam or Mary and uh, Moses. While Ismail is the uh, great grandfather of Prophet Muhammad Ismail, as you know, Ibrahim went from uh, 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 the land of Palestine, from Hebron, Al Khalil in Arabic, to what is called in the Bible a far land. The Bible does not define what that land in name. The Bible describes it. The, the Bible says a rocky land with the dark stones. When you think about it, you may say, well, that's Mecca. That's exactly what Mecca is, if you happen to be in, in, in Mecca. So uh, even if you don't ascribe to that theology, in Genesis, God promised Ibrahim, Abra Abraham to make of both of his sons great kingdoms. And therefore, I believe to my, I say to my Jewish brothers and sisters and Christian brothers and sisters that even in the Bible, it says that Prophet Muhammad will come about and that God will make of him a great kingdom. It's there in Genesis, I shall make of both of your sons great kingdoms. Isaac, and of him came the Judeo-Christian kingdom, the kingdom of Moses and the kingdom of, of Jesus. And out of Ishmael, came out the Arabs, out of which came out Islam. So you have these two great kingdoms that the Bible itself speaks, it speaks, it speaks about. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, prophets of God, those messengers of God, according to Islam, out of one path and of one family. The Quran tells us in more than one chapter uh, that such as uh, in uh, Surah 2, Ayah 132, 136, it says word by word that we la nufarriqu bayna ahadin min rusulin. We do not distinguish between any of God's messengers in any way, shape, and form. There's a hadith. Uh, for those of you who do not know what the word hadith means, it refers to things Prophet Muhammad said or did. And Prophet Muhammad said word by word, do not favor me or put me in a higher rank than Moses and Jesus. He made it 
very clear that we must not, as Muslims, do that. لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله. I always say to my Jewish brothers and sisters speaking in Hebrew that uh, when uh, one of the greatest prayers you read or hear in a synagogue Friday evening is Shema uh, Yisrael Adonai Elohino Adonai Echad, which is the very well-known prayer that comes from the Gospel of Luke when Jesus was asked by one of his disciples, O oh, good teacher, what is the best of all commandments? He said, what would be the same prayer? Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohino Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, O Jacob, our Lord God, God is one. Adonai Echad, God is, 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 is one. I always tell my Jewish brothers and sisters how we are really talking not only Elohino Echad, one God, uh, we are also talking about Mishpacha Echad. Mishpacha is the Hebrew word for family. It's only also one family. So one God, one family. About the family of what? Of Abraham, of Abraham. So we are talking about one father, two sons, and siblings. We are of one, of one family. We are sisters and we are brothers. This is how Islam a, 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 a speaks of or offers the story of Ibrahim, the story of Moses, the story of Jesus, or the story of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That they are all of one faith, the faith of Tawheed. And we we'll discussed that yesterday, how we have to maintain the unity of, of God, that to be true to God, we have to maintain that there's only one deity in charge of this universe. So we are one God, one family of the same sisters and the same brothers. Prophet Muhammad also spoke of those brothers in, in a beautiful way, beautiful way. He said, I am in relation to my brother Jesus and my brother Moses, listen to this, very much like a block in a wall made of blocks, stones. You are all, in, most of you are engineers, I believe. <laughs> So in a wall made of blocks, take any unit out, what happens? The wall wouldn't be incomplete, wouldn't be complete, would be incomplete. What does every wall do to the wall next to it? It makes it more beautiful and it strengthens it and it completes the structure. Here it is in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that the prophets strengthen each other. Do not weaken each other. So Prophet Muhammad is not in, in, a, in, a, in a war a struggle against Jesus. And Jesus is not in a war affair against Muhammad or against Moses. They are brothers and sisters of the same family, worshiping the very same God, confirming each other's message. So according to Islam, Mo, Jesus did not come for the goal of abrogating the teachings of, of of Moses, but try to confirm what was revealed in the Torah. And the Prophet Muhammad did not come with a message to abrogate the teachings of Jesus or Moses, but rather to confirm what is in both, which is actually the same. And I just narrated it in Hebrew and in English and in Arabic. And Abdullah, that you worship none but God. That's exactly what every prophet, according to Islam, taught. Number one message of all the prophets of God, from Noah to David to Solomon, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, from Moses to Jesus to Muhammad, all of them worshiped, taught, and Abdullah, or that there is no God for you but one God. So let's keep that in mind. One God, one family, one message, and that they have to complete each other. In Islam, however, there is a specific uh, concept, definition, by which we define the word prophet in Islam that is different from Judaism and the Christianity. I want you to keep that in mind for the Muslims and the non-Muslims in this hall. The prophets or the Anbiya, in Hebrew, Nivaim, uh, 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 
are sinless in Arabic ma'asul. So the prophets of God are sinless. What does sinless mean? It does not mean that they don't make mistakes in human affairs. You know, should I go up the hill or down the valley? You could make a mistake in that. Should I put more salt or less salt on my biryani? I don't know, you decide. Should I eat Chinese or Thai food? Whatever you like. You might eat Thai if you would end up with a bad stomach. That's up to you. You may make, a, you may make mistakes in that. But you are sinless when it comes to prophets do not steal, do not lie, do not commit adultery. Things like that. This is why we say the prophets of God in Islam are absolutely sinless and do not make, make those types of, of, of faults. And those the prophets of God are commissioned by God and not by human beings. So it's not that my tribe decides, you know, Muhammad, we like the way you look. We like your hair, we like your eyes, so sort of, you look attractive, you look sort of good for us, let's go and have you be a prophet. Or we think you're too smart to have PhD and postdoctorate, let us make you a prophet. It does not work like that. According to Islam, it's God who commissions these people to become the prophets and the messengers of God to humanity. So what is their message? Uh, uh, what is the message of those prophets? All of them. Some of it I already said. One God, who is God in the three uh, uh, teachings? whether the teachings of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. One God, this God is a God of love and a God of adoration. One origin, all of them taught that we come from Torah and to Torah we shall be returned. You see that in the Quran, you see that in the Bible. Often when people, when I travel across the country and people say, well, Imam Hindi, I think you have a heavy accent. I say, I know. If you have not noticed yet, I do. Yes, I do have a heavy accent. So Imam Hindi, where do you come from? I say, well, I come from dust. Dust. And believe me, someone once had a, a computer in front of him and started Googling, is this a new country added to the United Nations? <laughs> okay, what's your nationality? And I said, I'm Dustian. I do have an American citizenship and I'm proud of it, but my best nationality of which I'm very proud is Dustianship. And I remind Jews, Christians and Muslims, I remind every human being that from dust we come to dust we shall be returned. We are all Turabi. This has become, by the way, my theology and my politics. And I believe if human beings ascribe to that theology, the course of our human history will change. What are you arrogant about? You don't have a better origin than I. You don't come from gold, and I come from dust. You don't come from silver, and I come from dust. We come from the same origin, and therefore we are brothers and sisters in origin. And I think this is quite an important theology in the three uh, teachings of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad to teach us humility. From day one, be humble. Do not be arrogant. God is the only one who is up there. You are not. You come from dust to dust to which you shall be returned. I believe that Muslims pray five times a day for so many reasons, so many reasons, one of which I believe, and I could be wrong, is to remind ourselves five times a day that we come from dust to dust we shall be returned. So do not be arrogant. This is why when I put my forehead on the floor, what do I say? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Glory be to God, the highest in the highest. And therefore, God is the only one who is the highest and not me. In other words, don't be arrogant about your tie. Do not be arrogant about your watch. Do not be arrogant about anything. Be humble. You come from dust to dust, you shall be returned. You are not God, you will never become God. Be humble. By the way, even in the, in, in, in the church, if you go to a church, you have this idea of kneeling next to the altar. Also to remind the Christians of being humble. You go to a synagogue, if during a Yom Kippur service, if you have never been to a synagogue, go to a synagogue, if you have been, then you know this. If during a Yom Kippur service, what does a rabbi do? He flattens himself almost fully on the floor, very much like your position when you are in situate. To thank God to have given Moses the Torah, 
and to remind themselves of the need to be humble. So you have this concept of humility that originates from this idea that we come from dust to dust we shall be returned. One destiny. Moses taught this according to the Quran and according to the Torah. Jesus and Muhammad too taught us that no matter what, the moment we come, the moment comes and we will all die. We will all uh, going to be standing before God for judgment. Here it is where you have absolute unity between the, the, three, the teachings of all, of all the prophets of God. One set of commandments, all the prophets of God, spoke about the need to be shakur, to be grateful, abd al shakura in the Quran. The idea of being a grateful uh, a worshiper of God. Grateful to whom? You need to be grateful to God for the blessings of God upon you. Moses taught that, Jesus taught that, Muhammad taught that, Mary taught that, everyone taught that. Nice to my mother. What does the Quran say? What does Jesus say in describing his relationship to his mother? And I shall be good in the way I treat my mother. What does Moses, Moses do? When Moses becomes a little bit older, Moses looks after his mother in so many ways. At one point, he would not even want to leave Egypt without his mother staying behind. And he thought she was too old even to leave Egypt with him. So he had to struggle with this whole idea of a notion. What should I do about my mother? Should I stay in Egypt? And if I do, my people will be enslaved and mistreated by Pharaoh. But if I go, what will happen to my mother? So Moses had this love and affection to his mother. Prophet Muhammad, upon him uh, be peace. What did he say? If you remember, when someone came to him and said, Man sahbati, Who deserves my companionship, my, my best relationship? Muhammad said, your mother. Who comes next? Your mother. Who comes next? Your mother. Who comes next? Your father. Again, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad spoke about this concept of, of motherhood and the need to, to respect and honor, honor your, your, your mother. Sabr and Sabur. Trustworthy and Al-Amin. The Quran describes Moses with the description Al-Amin, the most trustworthy one. And the Prophet Muhammad is also described as a sadiq Al-Amin, the one who is trustworthy and who is truthful. Uh, uh, the concept of sacrifice, the whole story of sacrifice when Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his, his, his beloved son. That comes from the Bible. That also comes from the Quran. So you have this shared narration, shared story of, of, of the need to, to, to sacrifice. You could tell me, maybe we can discuss it later, the questions and answers. Imam Hindi, and someone asked me this last week in, in Toledo, Ohio, said, your God is so angry God and bloody God. I said, how so? You know, your God asks his, you know, Ibrahim to, to sacrifice his son. What kind of a religion is this? My response to, to, to that person was, number one, this is not only in the Quran, it's also in the Bible. So you go to church and do not judge me, you need to judge yourself first before you judge me. However, I said, I have my own understanding of this whole concept of sacrifice in a metaphoric way. Though I believe the story happened word by word as it is in the Quran and the Bible. Uh, 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 however, when I think about it, I think this concept of sacrifice has to continue with us till the day of judgment. How? Think about my brothers and my sisters. What did his son mean to him at the age 83 or 86? Everything. Everything. His son meant for him his life, his dreams, his hopes, aspirations, everything in life. God asks us on a daily basis to sacrifice something that is so dear to us for his glory. And I believe the most important thing to you and to me is what? Can you give it to me? What's the most important thing to you and to me and to us? Be honest about it. A word that made of three letters. Mom. Love, that's four. Mom. Mom. Now? Mom. Mom. <laughs> Being honest about it, ego. Ego. The most important thing to you and me, there's ego in us that we don't recognize. 
You do things for your own ego, your self-interest. So many wars in the world have been committed because of ego. So many people went to court because of ego. So many people cursed others because of ego. So many people demonized others because of ego. Ego is the most destructive in human history. Has been and will continue to be. Nothing divides between you and your spouse and your father and your mother and your neighbor than ego. Nothing more than ego. And I believe, number one, thing we have to sacrifice is the most important thing to us, and that is our ego. But that's when we become humble. That's when we become, we, we fall in touch with God. The Quran calls that min al-muqarrabin. We become very close to God. There is a wall, my brothers and my sisters, that divides us from God. And that wall is called arrogance, ego, self-centeredness. We don't think of God. <laughs> I, I would like that, yes. You know, this egocentric mentality, behavior, personality, is sometimes I call it egotism. You know, this egotism is killing us, but it's dividing us not only between me and you as a human being, it's dividing us from God. So number one thing we need to get rid of in our life is this egotism. You see that in the concept of sacrifice, in the story of Ibrahim, in the concept of sacrifice, in the story of Islam, this is why you have Eid al-Adha, the holy day of sacrifice every year, to remind ourselves we need to get rid of, of this egotism, of this arrogance, of something that is dear to me for the glory <coughs> of, of, of God. All of us prophets also taught peace. Jesus, according to the Bible, taught what? Blessed are the peacemakers, according to the Gospel of Luke, for they shall be called the children of God, according to Christianity. Well, in the Quran, Prophet Muhammad teaches us, Allah teaches us through the Prophet in the Quran, that when they cease to peace, you have to cease to peace too. In Kunta Basitan Ilayya Yadi, if you were to extend to me your hand to kill me, I will not extend my hand to you to kill you. You can kill me, I'm not gonna kill you. You know, you call that what? Non-violent resistance to oppression? It's in the Quran, a very clear ayah. You wanna kill me, I'm not gonna kill you. Why? Because God is the best of all the protectors. Even according to the Quran, there's a verse that says that. So Jesus taught that, Two, Moses told that uh, uh, too. This, the same set of rituals, all of those prophets taught what? The Qamat salah the need to establish salah, the need to give zakah. You see that verse by verse in the Quran, all the prophets of God, from Moses to Jesus to Muhammad to others. Mary was a prayerful woman, was a prayerful woman, according to Surah Ali Imran. She's known for her prayers. She's known for her closeness to, 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 to God. Uh, social justice was the central issue for all of those prophets of God. S social justice, central issue in the, for, in the forefront, free the slaves. What is otherwise the story of Moses of Egypt? Freeing the Israelites from the slavery of Pharaoh. It is in the Quran, it's also in the Bible. A very clear struggle a very clear principle, a very clear uh, 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 understanding in the mind of Moses that he cannot be close to God if his peoples continue to be the slaves of, of Egypt, the slaves of, 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 of Pharaoh. That is the Quranic story of the need to free the slaves, but that is also Jesus' story. Uh, you see that in the Bible, especially in Matthew 25, 30 to 46, when Jesus tells the Christians that they can never be true to God, to the Father in heaven, if they do not liberate the captive and liberate the captive and become a voice for the voiceless. But that's exactly what the Hadith al Qudus says in Islam. The Hadith al Qudus when God says, I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and you did not visit with me. I was hungry and you did not feed me. That's social justice. If you want to be close to Allah, if you want to be close to God, 
for it be close to the deity, you have to become a voice for the voiceless. You have to become a voice for the naked. You have to become a voice for those who have no shelter. You have to become a voice for the homeless. My brothers and my sisters, this is for me not a, a, a abstract theology. This is a theology that we have to live as we live. Let me give you some numbers. This year, I mean this last year in 2010, 14,600 women have been reported to have been sold to slavery and sex. According to another number, 23,000 women are sold to sex as we speak, to slavery as we speak. This last year, according to official statistics, 11,000 children under the age of five were sold to sex. This is real stuff. Painful to say it, but this is reality. Who's gonna become a voice for those men, for, for those women, and for those children? There are people enslaved across the world. We have to become a voice for them. For the, Google that, Google it under the concept of the trafficking. Trafficking of women. Women are trafficked every day as we speak to Dubai, to Tel Aviv, to Atlanta, Georgia, to Paraguay, South America. Go to the internet, wallahi, and you will not go to sleep after that if you, if you come across these numbers. This is real stuff. So this was the cry of Muhammad, this was the cry of Jesus, this was the cry of, 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 of Moses. We have to become a voice for the voiceless. Ask the tough questions. All of those prophets of God learned and taught us how to stand up and ask the tough question. What do I mean by that? Not to give in to normal cultural practices that may not make sense. You know what, what I'm talking about? Ibrahim alayhi salam, what did he do? The people of Ibrahim were worshiping what? Worshiping idols. Isn't that true? For so many years. And it became the norm. It became the cultural norm of his people. Worshiping idols, stones. Someone had to stand up and say, wait a minute guys, where are you going from here? The, to have the courage to stand up and tell your country men and women, you are wrong, is a prophetic experience, a prophetic example. Abraham stood up and told his people, I'm not going to go with your practice. What did Musa السلام, do? I came to the story I mentioned earlier. When he stood up to Pharaoh in the castle of Pharaoh, saying, I'm not going to give in to the practice of slavery against our people. That's what I'm talking about. Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace. Seven minutes until Salah, inshallah. Seven or seventy, seventy minutes, that's good. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my brother and my sisters, he looked around in Mecca. What did he see? Women killed at young age for no reason but being females. Was called what? He stood up to that and said, wrong. Prophet Muhammad, peace be with him, came to a society, I would call it tribal wars, influenced by tribal wars, tribes against each other killing one another, influenced by racism, the black against the white and the white against the black. What did he say? He said, all people are equal before God. There is no superiority to black over white or white over black. That is standing up to cultural norms where blacks were considered slaves and inferior. He said, he said, no longer will I allow that to happen. So he spoke in defense of women. When he stood up and said, acquiring knowledge is an obligation, upon every woman and man, that was standing up to cultural norms. When women did not have the right to education, Women did not have the right to become politically active. Women did not have the right to do any of that. When the Prophet, peace be with him, arrived in Medina, you know, after he lived, built his masjid and had a pact with the Jewish community, you know what he did? He established a new market. And he put in charge of that market a woman 
with the name of Shifa Bintu Ubaidillah. I call Shifa the first Secretary of Commerce in the history of the world. And at that time in tribal Arabia, women did not have education. Women did not have a say in the political system, in the economic system. Women were sold like what? Like any product in the house. So for the Prophet of Islam to come forward and say, guys, I'm going to change this. From now on, no killing of women alive, no burying females alive. I stand up in defense of women. That's number one, radical change to a society that was radically violent against women. It stood up and said, not only that, I'm going to equip them with the way of self-defense, knowledge. So acquiring knowledge is an obligation upon females and males. That is radical change for a society that had to be changed. But it needed what? A courageous leadership. Someone who had the courage to stand up and say, you know my people, I'm not interested in what you are doing. But you know what, my brothers and my sisters, every time you do that, you end up defamed, hated, and rejected. Look to what happened in America in the history of our country, Martin Luther King. He had to, to pay his life for the values he stood up for. Uh, Gandhi in India, look to what happened to him. Look to what happened to Prophet Muhammad, peace be with him. What happened to him? 13 years of education of trying to propagate the message of Islam, he could not do it. His people were killed one after the other in front of him. And finally he had to leave to propagate the message of Islam in a different situation. He never gave up, but he had to change the location to keep the momentum going. What happened to Moses when he stood up for the freeing of the Israelites? He had to leave the whole country with all of his people and across the sea into a new land, unknown land. So he had to flee too. I tell the Christians, when I watched a few years ago the documentary, the film, uh, The Last Passion of Jesus, of Christ, I did not like that movie for so many reasons, one of which is that it only spoke about what happened to Jesus according to the Bible, meaning the last seven days of his life. But it overlooks even the biblical narrative of what put Jesus on the cross according to Christians. What put Jesus on the cross? Is it because he was saying worship God? No. Jesus stood up to the norms of the Roman Empire and told the Roman Empire, I'm not gonna anymore allow you to do what you are doing. So enslaving men and women is not gonna be allowed and tolerated anymore. He said, look at what you are doing in the name of the Torah. I'm not going to allow that to happen anymore. So he with courage stood up against the institution, the political institution, the religious institution. He spoke up in defense of what of the poor. He said, he who does not care for the poor shall not follow me to the altar. Before you come to pray, you have to stand up for the poor. And if you don't stand up to the poor, I don't want you to be of me. So that's exactly what the passage in Matthew says. The passage in Matthew says that on the day of judgment, Jesus will say to those who did not become a voice for the naked, Jesus will say, don't come close to me. You are not of me. Why, Jesus? And he will say, because you did not stand up for the naked on earth. I can't stand up for you on this day. It is that theology, it's that politics that put Jesus on the cross according to Christian theology. But we, we forget that. And we only for, remember one aspect of his life according to Christianity. I say, my brothers and my sisters, you have to stand up for the truth. You have to stand up for justice. You have to stand up for what is right, regardless of what it costs you. Martin Luther King said 40 years ago, it does not matter how long I live, but what I live for. It does not matter when I die, but what I die for. I don't want you to go out and volunteer your body to death, but I want you to stand up to become a prophetic voice of justice, very much like Jesus, very much like Moses, 
very much like Muhammad, no matter what it costs you. For me, this is the most important message I want you to go home with today. I know we have to go to prayer. We started half an hour late. <clears throat> but, but if I were to summarize what I said in the last uh, uh, half an hour, I would say my brothers and my sisters, these messengers of God, chosen by God, focused on, number one, the need to become a worshiper of God, meaning to fall in love with God. Enough to allow your soul, your mind, and your heart to become one with the will of the Creator. In the Bible, they call that you worship God with all of your mind, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul. That's exactly what the term Islam or Yastaslim means. It means that you surrender your totality to God, you surrender your, your soul, you surrender your mind, you surrender your heart, you surrender your flesh to God in every way, shape, and form so that you are absolutely shaped by the teachings of the Creator. That's number one message with which I want to leave you. Number two message that brought all of these prophets and messengers of God together is that they stood up for family values. All of them spoke about the need to respect your mother, the need to cater for your children. All of them spoke about the importance of protecting your family, the father, the mother, the daughter, and the son, that this unit is the most important government in human history. And if you cater for the needs of the small family, then you cater for the needs of the human family. And number three, social justice. All of those messengers of God spoke about the need to become a voice for the voices. And therefore, I leave you with three sentences before we go to prayer. For me, that summarizes the unified message of all the prophets and the messengers of God. Write them down, and I hope you memorize them. And you reflect on them as you move on with your life. Number one, politics of justice. Number two, economics of equity. Number three, covenant of community. These are the three values that the Prophet Muhammad taught, that the Prophet Moses taught, that the Prophet Jesus taught, that Ibrahim taught, that Mary taught, that the wife of Pharaoh taught, that the mother of Moses taught, that Aisha taught. Write them down, memorize them. Number one, politics of justice. Number two, economics of equity. Number three, covenant of community. I define them and go to prayer. Politics of justice means no government can succeed and progress if it fails to do justice in its governance. Justice for every individual, justice for every citizen, justice for every member of that society. Politics of justice. Justice to every man, to every woman, to every race, to every ethnicity, and to every religion. No one is left out of that politics of justice. Number two, covenant of uh, economics of equity, which means everyone has to be paid for the work they do. Number two, every human being or all people have to have equal access to wealth and to financial progress. Number three value, covenant of community. That is to say, in order to honor our ahad, mithaq, the Quran calls it, in order to honor our covenant with God, we have to honor our covenant with our fellow brothers and sisters. You can never be true to Allah. You can never be true to your faith. And I say this to all of you, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. You can never be true in your faith. You can never be true in your prayer. You can never be true in your fasting. 
You can never be true in your meditation, in your decor. You can never be true as you read your Bible or your Torah or your Quran if you are not true to the human family. In other words, if you do not become a true humanist dedicated to serving the human family, you can never be true to God. Inspired by the verse in chapter 13, verse 49. I recite it and go to prayer. Chapter 13, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 49, verse 13. It says, O humankind, I, God, created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may come to know each other, not that you may despise each other. One God, one human family, one origin, one destiny, one goal in life to love God with all our minds, hearts, and souls, and to honor our fellow brothers and sisters in our human family. So let us go to prayer, thinking about who you are as Turabi, as Dustian, with one citizenship, Dustianship. Salaamu Alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Uh, inshallah, we will uh, continue with this lecture after prayer. Just a few, just a few uh, tidbits of information that you need. Prayer will be next door. Um, we'll give five minutes for anyone who needs to make wudu. Uh, the sisters will enter from the door over there as they do usually, and the brothers will enter. We'll open this door over here for any brother that needs to go in and pray. All the non-Muslims, please hold on to your seats, and uh, we'll be back shortly, inshallah, within 15 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>